Dr. Alex here, and welcome to the first in the long-promised and not-delivered series of the marvellous musical mayhem of the Marlin Museum. Wow, that is quite a mouthful to say, and you won't believe how many takes that took. Apologies if my voice sounds a bit weird, I am in the middle of having a cold, but uh, hopefully I won't snot too much or sneeze over the camera lens. We shall see. So, as you can see behind me, and superimposed, I assume, by the time I've finished editing this video, I hope I just gestured in the right direction, you will see all the items in the marvellous musical Marlin Museum, starting with the guitar I'm holding here, which is my first ever guitar that I owned, and also the first ever Marlin I owned, and still my main and favourite guitar, the one I will use out of preference over all of the others. Because I've had it the longest, it still sounds the best, in my opinion, and it's been modified slowly but surely over the years until it is quite unique. And although I've modified the other guitars largely in line with that. None of them are exactly the same. They all feel slightly different and they're all brilliant in their own way. But I will always return to my first and favourite guitar because it is just pure brilliance. It's a black strat copy. Marlin Sidewinder, second generation essentially from the Korean factories where they were using very high density but nonetheless pressed plywood bodies which you might think is ugh, horrible. Really dense, really heavy, beautiful tone probably largely due to the maple neck that they had. This solid maple neck is true, straight, hasn't warped over the years. And uh, I have, as I say, modified this guitar quite a bit, but it's still essentially a Marlin Sidewinder from the latter part of the 80s and is my main guitar whenever I try and record, although I have recorded with many of the other guitars as well. Each item, and they're not just guitars, in the Marlin Museum will get its own video but I will do a quick overview of each item here and talk about some of the common features of the guitars. As I said, I've modified them all to my own peculiar tastes and therefore they share some features in common which are something that I like but many guitarists probably won't. So, the first item in the museum is of course this black strat copy, Marlin Sidewinder, as already described, it's from the Korean era when the factories moved to Korea. So anywhere from about 1986 to the end of the run pretty much. Um, there were, as far as I can work out, and there is not much literature on the Marlins, um, there are about three generations of Marlin guitars. The first generations, which are our three examples in the room right now, are East German in manufacture. They have solid basswood bodies. They have a much more traditional Strat structure in that they are three single coil pickups. They have only 21 frets as opposed to the 22 frets on the Super Strat later models. Um, but again, they sound amazing. They have features of their own which make them incredibly unique and robust. The East German pickups, for example, have these huge whopping great magnets stuck on the back to uh, improve their output. Um, they're all wax potted. The East German ones, the later Korean made ones, they're all wax potted um, pickups, so they don't tend to feed back uncontrollably. They, they are gigging guitars, believe it or not. And as such, a bargain. I bought my first guitar when I was still in school, probably somewhere between 1990 and 1991, when I joined my first band and decided, um, as a singer, and decided that I couldn't just be a singer because singers, in my uh, arrogant opinion back then, couldn't be trusted to write songs on their own, and you had to know an instrument. I had tried to learn piano for around that time for about a year, and was unable to syncopate the left and right hand. They were just completely unable to do that. Uh, and I also realized I was unable to carry a piano. But guitars, they look cool. Um, a singer can carry a guitar quite easily and still stand up to the microphone as I'm doing right now. And I also realized very quickly that guitars are just freaking cool. Um, so if I could play the guitar and sing, I'd get basically both the top jobs. So slowly but surely I learned guitar while I was being the singer in my first band. And later on in subsequent bands, I got to do my dream job of being lead singer and lead guitarist um, in these tiny bands. I mean, come on, we're not talking like I didn't we didn't press any records here, old school. We didn't uh, release any digital outputs um, back then in those days. 
and um, the bands were never big. They were all like pub bands at most, and that's really exaggerating. Small venue bands. But we had fun. Anyway, what was I going to say? So, this black strap was the first guitar I had. And I will talk about the modifications in a moment, which I've done to all of these guitars. The second Marlin that I picked up was actually while I was working in my first... No, it was when I was working in my second job after uni. Um, a friend at work had a spare bass guitar. He didn't want any more. And he said, do you want a bass? And I said, yeah, I'll just pick up an extra instrument for nothing. Because he was giving it away for free. I was like, that's, I should have maybe started with that. This bass guitar over here is a Marlin bass guitar. Now, usually these P basses, which is, again, what they're, they're cloning, uh, were called Marlin Slammer basses. This one doesn't seem to have the Slammer label on it. It also has the later uh, Marlin by Hona label because later on, Marlin were bought by Hona. Marlin originally were a Welsh import company importing these guitars first from East Germany and later from Korea. But as the Marlins became more popular in the late 80s, they got bought by Hona, who then rebadged them partly with their own Hona badges, and later, as far as I can tell, changed their manufacturing process. Now, they may have kept the factories in Korea, but they definitely changed the quality. Now, I don't have any of this third generation Marlin, and so I'm basing this largely on my observations of the subsequent guitars that Hona rebranded to Rockwood. Now, these Rockwood guitars almost certainly came out of the same factories because the amplifiers, the Marlin amplifiers, one up there and there's one down there, the big 50, they basically continued identically to how they were with the Marlin badge. So they just took the Marlin badges off and stuck Rockwood badges on them instead. So I'm fairly certain they kept the same factories for output, but the quality control went through the toilets, as far as I can tell, with these last generation Marlins. The necks, the frets weren't sanded in properly. These are I mean, I never had trouble with any of these guitars. The frets are beautifully married into the edge of the neck, so you're not catching your fingers going up and down. They're leveled properly. Uh, if you, as long as you adjust it well, you have a beautiful neck that's um, very easy to play. And you can get the action very, very low, so you can get some uh, very fast playing if you need to. But when they brought out this last generation, this pre-Rockwood generation of Marlins, they messed with the necks, uh, the headstocks, I should say. So they made the headstocks a lot more pointy, but the necks just look more flimsy and less finished. And so I think Marlin gained this poor reputation because of the last generation of Marlins that were produced. But the first generations, the East German ones, are like freaking tanks. They are proper strats. They feel like them. They play like them. And their tone is amazing, largely because of their, in some cases, steel and in some cases, zinc blocks that they had. The next generation ones, although they weren't base wood like the East German one, the first generation Korean Marlins still had amazingly good necks. The bodies, although they were now super dense pressed plywood, were very, very heavy. So they still had body and tone to them uh, in a way that the later, the pre-Rockwood Marlins did not. Their plywood was much, much more flimsy. It was a low density plywood. Um, if you try and do any work on them, you'll find bits of wood chipping off all over the place because they are much more flimsy. They're lighter, easy to pl pick up and move around if you're not particularly strong or, you know, lightness is something you really need, but it does affect the tone. Also, their internals were way, way down on quality. The trem blocks were very thin. The trem systems themselves were very much like a bent piece of tin rather than the more substantial trems that the earlier Marlins had. For example, the East German ones have a almost almost absolutely standard strat bent l-shaped piece of metal plate as their trem plate but they're strong rigid trem plates they're not going to get distorted easily the later but early generation korean marlins often had these incredibly sophisticated trem plates a sort of a faux floyd rose um, floating trem uh, with fine tuning nuts and uh, a very unique and irritating uh, trem arm system uh, which if you ever lose the tram arm that you can't replace because you can't find these things for love and the money. Um, but they were really quite nicely set up. They're, they are robust, if nothing else. They also often came with locking nuts. Now, you can probably tell even at your distance that I've removed the fine-tuning nuts and I've removed the locking nuts because locking nuts, as I have quickly discovered, are way more trouble than they're worth, particularly if you have a trem on it. Because you tune it up, you put the locking nuts on, you, you wang the tremolo bar, and you pull the strings out of tune. And then you want to retune them, well, you've got the fine-tuning nuts, which have a small amount of play. And of course, if you come to the end of the fine-tuning nuts, you've nowhere else to go. So that reminds me of 
amps going up to 11. But anyway, the fine tuning nuts were a fanciful but largely useless addition, and the locking nuts were actually more trouble than they're worth. So I just stripped, and you'll find many of these miners are the same. They've stripped the locking nuts off. They even sometimes strip off the fine tuning. The fine tuning is less of a bind, but I just didn't see the point. And actually, there was another reason why the fine tuning nuts were eventually removed, which I'll come on to in a minute. As I said, the blocks in the East German Marlin sidewinders were solid metal. They were either steel or, I think, zinc or brass. Um, I'll have to look at the back of them when I do the reviews of each one in turn, but they are solid, high-quality, high-density metal blocks. The one downside that I can find with the later but early Korean models are their blocks. The Trem blocks were this weird grey alloy, which I'd heard rumours that they, they were terrible, but I'd had this guitar until 2016 without any trouble. Now, that was from 1991, let's say, to 2016, so that's 25 years that I'd owned this guitar. Plus, this guitar was probably made at least four, maybe five years before that. So we're talking a guitar that lasted pretty much 30 years with the block in place. However, I did discover eventually what people were complaining about. Because after a party, someone had wanged the tremolo bar around, and suddenly I came to it in the morning, and the plate was flying up in the air, and it was completely out of tune. And then I looked inside and found that the block had crumbled to dust. It had just fractured apart and broken to a million pieces. And this is a common complaint about this particular guitar and its trem blocks. So it's a justifiable complaint. Yeah, those crappy grey alloy trem blocks do dissolve like... I don't know, Thanos had clicked his fingers or something, and they disappear. But to be fair, this one did last 30 years before it did that. Now, I've also heard the complaint that because they're non-standard trem blocks and trem plates, you can't find a replacement. This is a lie. This now has a standard small block for a um, Mexican, I think it's a Mexican Strat, um, and it's a this is now a rolled steel block in there. So I've replaced the steel block. The plus side to that is that I was able to then fit a standard trem bar with a screw rather than the slot in weird Floyd Rose, you will never find a replacement for love and money trem bar that was in there before. So you can replace these blocks on these. You can replace them with a better block and you can get a standard tremolo arm. Anyway, I'm sure I got distracted there. Anyway, the second Marlin, as I started describing before I got distracted, was the P base, which was a Marlin slammer, but this is a later one which just has the Honer badge on it. It's actually very good, however, eventually the electrics got a little bit um, messed up, and because I don't care about bass guitars as much as I do about lead guitars, I just threw the plate away and replaced the entire plate on the front with a off the rack from eBay uh, new plate. So this is the original Marlin base, but it's had the electrics just torn out and the new, new one slotted in because it's just a workhorse for me as well. When I need to use a base, it's there, but I don't care about the bases as much as I do about the lovely, lovely guitars because they're, they're just so cool and the bases are, yeah, fine. No, the bases are, I, bases are cool too. I know, bases are lovely. Bases, I'm sorry, I love, I love it too, like a, like a third or fourth child. Okay, moving on. The reason I got the next Marlin was a bit strange. I'd been trying to make a travel guitar that was equivalent to my normal guitar, this Marlin Sidewinder I'm holding right now. And one of the reasons I love the Marlins is that they I'd never bought a Marlin Stratocaster copy, Sidewinder or Slammer, for more than £50. They've always cost less than 50 Even this, when I first bought it way back in 1991 or whenever, about that, 1990 or 91, this only cost me 50 quid. And everyone subsequently has been £50 or below. So I think I may have single-handedly beaten up the prices because on eBay at the moment, I can't find them very easily for that price. They're now like triple that, 150 Perhaps I've spread the word too well about Marlin guitars and people just start to value them in the way that they should be. But anyway, to me and my mind, Marlins have been both high quality in terms of their output and their sound, but also cheap and therefore in a way disposable, which is why I felt free to modify my first guitar and why I bought every other Marlin with a mind to modifying them as well. The next one, though, that I bought was with an extreme idea in mind. The next Marlin was a Marlin Sidewinder, but it turned out to be an East German one, although I didn't really fully appreciate that at the time, but I certainly did once I started making the modification. That one I modified into a travel guitar, and I will give that one its own video, but basically to do so, I cut the end of the body off and then reattached it with a hinge. 
while doing that, I discovered it was basswood all the way down, which immediately made me think this is not the same as this Stratocaster, this Marlin Sidewinder. Also, it had the three single coils, it had one less fret, its headstock was a slightly different size. In fact, all the headstocks on these are slightly different sizes. Uh, some have got larger headstocks veering towards you know, a standard old school Strat, and some of them have got much smaller Super Strat-y headstocks. And that's even within the East German ones, the natural finish one there, the white one there, and the Sidewinder there. Each one has a slightly different size headstocks. I mean, I think conceivably two of them might have the same size. The white one and the natural one are both slammers, so I, there's a good chance they'll have the same size headstock, but I'm not going to swear to that. I'll compare them later. Uh, the Sidewinder has a definitely a different headstock. Bizarrely, the Sidewinder has a larger headstock, more like an old trad strat, whereas the slammers have a slightly smaller headstock, more like the super strat, although they're otherwise identical in every way. Uh, the smallest headstocks of all come on the later career models, like the one I'm holding here, which obviously kind of goes with the later look, super stratty way of doing it. Anyway, so that was the third one I bought, the, fir the second Marlin lead guitar and the third Marlin guitar, if you include the bass, that I ever bought, the travel guitar down there behind me at my feet, which will get its own video, and we'll talk about that in another one. The next one I bought, and I may get the order wrong here, I think was the white Marlin Slammer. In fact, now I'm almost certain that was the order, because I bought it out of guilt, having hacked apart this beautiful East German Marlin Sidewinder behind me, and felt kind of bad that I'd taken this rare, because the East German ones are rarer, because they were one year of production only in the first year of the, of the Marlin guitar production. So I felt bad about hacking it to pieces to make the travel guitar, so I thought I should get one that I don't hack apart to turn into, well, just to have as another guitar, really. So I bought the white Marlin Slammer because I also wanted a white guitar. I had a red one, I had a black one, obviously I needed a white one because I had to complete the color collection. So anyway, I got the white one, the excuse being I needed a white guitar and I needed an East German one that I hadn't ruined by cutting it to pieces. It's still got modified. They've all been modified in almost the same way. Uh, the least modified of them being perhaps the natural wood one over there. Uh, you'll notice, if you can see well enough, that every one of my strats has got the middle pickup missing. Uh, they also have all been scalloped on the necks. And anyone who knows guitars and guitarists will probably guess who my favourite guitarist is. Yes, it is Richie Blackmore. And I do love playing Richie Blackmore's work. And I also like sounding like Blackmore as much as I can. Obviously, I'm not Richie Blackmore. But I like trying to sound like his um, tone and style as much as possible. It's the way I like to play. I don't just like him, of course. I mean, I like Hendrix as well, um, almost at the same level. And they're very similar in the way they play in many ways. And they have a similar sound and tone because they're both using strats as well. Anyway, but most of this guitar is much more in line with Richie Blackmore's strats. So fully scalloped, uh, middle pickups taken out, or in the case of the plain wood one over there, lowered. Um, each guitar is actually slightly different than in the way it's been wired. This one, I replaced the five-way switch with a three-way, and it actually has front middle and back depending on which of the three positions you've got in other ones i've left the switches in position and have the middle one as a cutout or the rear one as a cutout if i've shifted one of the pickups from one place to another so they're all slightly different in their setup which is good because i have some flexibility depending on what i want to do with them anyway that's the white strat out of the way the next one i bought um was almost certainly the one that's behind me i'm going to step slightly to one side for a second Okay, hopefully you saw that. That was, or is, the Shed guitar. Each guitar has its own unique job, so there was absolutely no reason why I shouldn't buy one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, there was no reason not to buy six, essentially, Stratocaster guitars. They all have a unique job to do. There is nothing wasted here. There is no superfluous guitars in this collection. Anyway, um, so Shed guitar is down in the music shed, so I don't have to carry anything down there um, when I need to record down in the shed for whatever music things I might want to do there, or just for playing and practicing the shed. Um, the shed also contains the Hammond B200 organ, the Leslie speaker, a large Marlin amplifier, another 50 um, reverb. I've got three Marlin 50 reverbs over time. The first one being the one you can see just behind me, hopefully. 
Uh, that one I bought for about £12 off eBay because I wanted a large guitar amplifier to go with the Hammond organ to give a good distorted guitar amp sound to mimic the John Lord sound, again from Deep Purple. However, it sounded so good after I refurbed it, um, it most of them won't look like that. That has missing its outer toluene black covering. So I just varnished it, edged it, put some extra corner protectors on, repaired the speaker, which was slightly damaged, and it sounded so amazing, way better than I would expect a solid state amp to sound, that I just couldn't leave it out in the shed. I had to bring it up indoors, because also that amplifier sounds really good at low volume, so I can play it, it sounds good, and it doesn't annoy the neighbours. But if I want to annoy the neighbours, it's got 50 watts of power, so I can rack that thing up, and it really belts out a lot, given it's one single 10-inch, I think, speaker in there. But 50 watts of power, a large, I'd say probably oversized cabinet, given the size of the speaker, but the sound it gives is undeniably cool. It's got quite a bit of bass there, probably because of the large volume. Anyway, I went slightly off tangent again. So, shed guitar, out in the shed, uh, is largely set up to be identical to black guitar. So, black guitar being the main one, I wanted to copy that as close as I could with the shed guitar. Shed guitar has unfortunately got has unfortunately got a rosewood fretboard, which is not my favourite, but it actually makes not a bit of difference when you're playing it. It's fully scalloped again. It's down to three pickups. The middle one's missing. I think there's a slight difference in the selector setup because I think the middle is the back pickup and the back the bottom setting or the back setting is actually the cutout. So that one's got a cutout. So you can go cut the thing out, which is cool talk about that more later when I do a video on that specifically. Penultimately, in terms of purchases of Marlin Sidewind or, or Slammer guitars, there is my work guitar, which I might just gesture over here, hopefully will be floating here somewhere. The work guitar was one that obviously had a justifiable purpose. I needed a guitar at work. But, you know, you always need to have a, an extra guitar hanging around. Also, I bought another Marlin 50 Reverb amp for work. So I also have a work amplifier. And that one is actually the most pristine of the three reverb amps I've got. Uh, it's still painted. It hasn't been damaged in, in any way, really. I've done some minor touch-ups on it, but I didn't need to repair the speaker. It's a perfect example at work. There is another one of those in the shed doing the job, which I originally intended that one to do, which is the distorted guitar sound for the Hammond organ. So that's why I have three Marlin Reverb 50 amps. Again, costing between about £12 and £25 maximum. So again, a real bargain. They sound amazing. You'll hear a little bit more of that one in a minute when I demonstrate why I've set the guitars up in the way I have. But I never rated or thought I would rate a solid state amplifier. I think, oh, it's got to be a tube. It's got to have valves in it somewhere but no they sound remarkably good and I do like them I do have another Vox uh, valve pre uh, preamp amplifier in the shed that's the shed amplifier but and I do like it but I've definitely used the Marlin reverbs for recording and for actually doing concerts as well because they are good powerful solid beautiful sounding amplifier, particularly when married with these really nice guitars. The final guitar that I bought, the final Marlin that I bought, was the Marlin Slammer over there, the natural wood finish one. And I must confess, the only reason I bought that is because I don't normally like natural wood finish guitars, but this one just caught my eye on eBay as being quite nice because of the dark colour of the wood. And uh, its purpose had to then become it is the spare guitar in case one of them gets broken in a violent concert-related accident. It's a perfectly good justification for owning another guitar. It also hangs on the back of one of the doors in my flat, which is also natural wood, so it's kind of like a chameleon guitar, so it kind of blends into the door. It's really cool. Um, but anyway, this one I modified the least. Uh, I've even not pulled out the third pickup, uh, the middle pickup, rather. I just lowered it as far as I could go. And it also has some uh, some of the least aggressive scalloping of all my guitars. That and the work guitar, I did a, a different way of scalloping those two. So we've got a, a little bit more of a gentle scallop. Still perfectly fine for me to play on, but I suspect a little bit easier for normal people to play as well who don't like scallop necks. Anyway, I've managed to cover all of the purchases, I think. Oh, no, I missed one. There is the one on top of the Franken organ. The Franken organ is the uh, Vermona organ plus the Yamaha Clavanova plus that Marlin 10 practice amp plus that laptop over there which has a bunch of VST um, instruments on it. This whole shebang together is 
another organ keyboard instrument that I have used from time to time in recording stuff. The amplifier is mostly for the organ to go through, and again, the 10L is powering the guts of what was previously a Hammond organ's chassis underneath, which still has the working Leslie speaker in it. So that 10L amp is pushing out through not its own speaker, but through this rather larger series of speakers in the underside of this former Hammond organ, and is providing a Leslie speaker with distortion, because of the distortion on the 10L amp, for the organ, or, if I choose to do so, for the VST instruments, because I can switch between the two. So that was the other 10L. And there may be another 10L in the shed. I've got a horrible feeling I actually bought two 10Ls. But, so there may be another um, orphan Marlin item floating out in the shed. So I think I've now fully covered everything that's in the Marlin Museum. I'll do one more thing. Hopefully I've got time. I don't know how long this is going to stretch out into. But I'll tell you why I've modified the Marlin lead guitars in the way that I have. So the scallop neck is so it can be played quickly. Now, let me just turn that up a little. Wow. Uh, sorry. Amaze myself. Not me, but the guitar is an amazing sound. So having it scalloped makes it much easier to bend notes. Uh, you can play a bit quicker because you're not hitting the resistance of the wood. Okay, anyway, you can see it's very, very easy to play, or at least for me it's very easy to play. The other reason I've got it set up the way I do, and they're all set up in the same way, the middle pickup I tend to not use. Um, one or two of the guitars, like this one, have the middle settings set so they pick up both front and back. So you can have the front pickup. I've got it on a really low volume at the moment for a reason. Um, you know, we have put front and back together. Or the rear pickup, which is actually probably my favorite, actually, out of all the pickups available. So they're all set up in various combinations of that, front and back, middle missing, except for the plain wood one, which actually has all three, but I don't use the middle one. It's down low, out of the way. Now, the other way in which I have this perhaps uniquely set up, or very idiosyncratically set up for me, is I've got the pickups set as high as I can, as close to the strings as possible. So they're giving as high an output as possible. And this is because I have the amplifier set up with the volume initial volume, first stage volume, set to near maximum. The master volume controls the output volume for the setting, so whether it's going to be in a gig or in a, in a room in a flat, that is controlled by the master volume. But then the volume control on the guitar controls the sound in all cases. So at the moment I've got the volume set on about one and a half, maybe two. And <laughs> And if you play it nicely, it doesn't distort at all. There we go. Um, and again, on all, four, all different positions, it's not distorting, it's a, a nice little sound. Sometimes I like the middle position. And front, which is a bit sticky on this one. There you go. <laughs> pickup 
is very nice, very bluesy. It's a a really nice counter to the rear pickup, which is much more harsh and metally. But again, it's got a nice, clean sound. But as I've already hinted, the reason why I've got it set up in the way as on the amp, why this is set up so high, is because I've got full range of control on the guitar sound through the volume control. So at the moment it doesn't really distort. It's on the edge of distorting, basically, on a very low volume. But if I turn it up to five, about halfway. <laughs> already it's got some distortion in there if I play it hard I can still play it softly and get something that's edge of distortion I'm still not all the way there. So that was on five, and in fact, five or six is about where you need to be for. <laughs> However, like the best amplifiers in the world, this one goes up to 11. No, it goes up to 10, but by the time you're up to 10 on this thing, you're into some pretty heavy distortion territory. <laughs> distortion for me and this is at a low volume as well so you can imagine if that thing's turned up to not flat levels that that's quite heavy at least by my taste I mean I was never really into that much into the 80s uh, hair metal or even speed metal scene I mean that level of distortion I don't really care for I want Hendrixy Blackmore level of distortion where you can kind of still hear the instrument and that's one of the reasons I like these instruments. All of these instruments have a beautiful tone. They sound really nice clean. Not only do they sound really nice clean or through an amp, but they actually have a beautiful tone when they're unplugged. In fact, I spent many hours playing this guitar without an amplifier because I couldn't be bothered to turn it on or find it. Uh, I also spent many hours playing without a plectrum, which is how I ended up playing with my thumb and forefingers. And then, and then I ended up buying these thumb picks to basically give me the attack with the plectrum. Um, if I just lower this down a bit, uh, you can hear something of the tone more clearly when the guitar is unplugged, which I think gives you an indication of why these guitars sound so good. They've got a good natural tone. So there's obviously a massive jump cut there and you can't hear me anymore, but anyway, here's what it sounds like unplugged. <laughs>
Anyway, I'm back. So, uh, you can hear that the guitar's natural tone is quite strong. In fact, you can hear this guitar very well, even probably at this distance. Of course, that comes out silent now, which has completely proved me wrong. But these guitars have a brilliant innate tone. They also have good pickups. Given how cheap these guitars were originally, they had remarkably nice bits of kit on them. The pickups are original, and they're still with the wax potted, and they still work perfectly. Uh, you could hear that the selector on that is a little bit sticky when it goes to the bass uh, setting. So it obviously needs a clean, but come on, this guitar is over 30 years old. Everything needs a clean after that length of time. I certainly do. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this brief, brief introduction to the Marlin Museum and the marvellous musical mayhem therein. And I will do more detailed descriptions and videos on each item individually in turn as we go through. Anyway, I hope you can forgive my cold, afflicted voice and my somewhat dodgy, rough playing, because I really could do with warming up a bit more. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you join me for the next one in the series. Take care. <laughs>